Hello, hello, everyone, and welcome to the Research Roundtable. My name is Kyle King. I am the one month older and more sophisticated version of the Kyle King that hosted last month's roundtable. Um, and just like last month, though, I still do the same things. I'm a IOCDF advocate. Um, I am a junior at Yale University. I'm actually in Florida right now um, visiting my parents and I wanted to take advantage of the sunny weather because Connecticut is cold and awful all the time. Um, so I'm doing this outside. Um, but yeah, I'm a junior at Yale studying neuroscience with a particular interest in OCD, not only because I think it's a really interesting disorder with a lot of interesting facets, but also because I have it. Um, so it's treatment and, and research avenues mean a lot to me. Um, as always, I'm joined by my co-host, John Abramowitz. John, if you want to say something about yourself. Sure, I'm John Abramowitz. I'm a professor at the University of North Carolina, and I study OCD, and I work with folks um, who come to our clinic for, for treatment for OCD, and it's my the, the love of my life to do this kind of work. I, I get a lot out of it and love to learn, and I'm especially looking forward to learning from Guy and Danny uh, today on this very interesting topic. Yeah, um, our topic today is relationship OCD, which... As someone with OCD, I'm selfishly very interested in um, because I've been in relationships before and it's always been confusing in my own head. Is this uh, relationship OCD symptoms cropping up or am I just having normal doubts about a relationship like any person would? Um, so I have my own personal questions and I have questions like for, you know, the general audience, but I want to be selfishly motivated a little bit. Um, and we do have two guests today who have spent a lot of time researching this topic, but before we introduce them and while people start joining the stream, I have a couple of things that I have to say. Um, first, this live stream is educational and is not intended to replace therapy. For treatment related questions, please work with your provider or contact a local clinician. You can use the IOCDF's online resource directory at iocdf.org slash find help to locate a trained clinician near you. The International OCD Foundation is not a crisis hotline. If you're in a crisis or if you're ever feeling suicidal and unsafe, please go to your local emergency room or call 911 or the 988 Suicide and Crisis Lifeline by dialing 988. You can also access online at 988lifeline.org. Also, um, as always, this is a live stream, so anything that you put in the comments uh, is on the internet and will live on the internet forever, and like we can't do anything about it if it's there. So. Uh, please be respectful in the comments. We really do want you to use it. We like when we you ask questions, and because we have experts um, on a, a subtype of OCD that's pretty common and crops up a lot, and it's something that pro people have a lot of questions about, um, we want you to throw in your questions. But just know that anything that you say in there will live there forever. Um, all right. Why don't we introduce our guests? Um, I'm going to start with Guy. <laughs> so... Guy, who's directly below me on my screen, is an associate professor at the New School of Psychology Interdisciplinary Center. I'm going to butcher this. Hers, Leah? Close? Yeah. 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 I'll take it. Um, yeah, Dr. Yeah. Has a, Dr. Duran has a bachelor's in psychology that was completed magnum cum laude and a bachelor's in psychology completed with high distinction at the University of Melbourne, Australia. At the University of Melbourne, he completed a PhD in master's clinical psychology. Dr. Duran has been actively researching OCD and related phenomena since the year 2000. His clinical experience includes working in hospitals, clinical research centers, and as a private practitioner. These activities have led to an extensive knowledge and understanding of OCD, anxiety, depression, and related phenomenon, as well as a growing number of publications in this area. Dr. Duran, the people want to know, is a hot dog a sandwich? It's a hard one, man. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you have to ask John or Danny. I don't eat hot dogs. <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah. Uh, you can punt on that question. I'll yeah. go to Danny then. Um, Dr. Danny Derby <laughs> is a clinical psychologist, clinical psychologist and has a PhD in human sexuality. He is the founder and director of Cognectica, the, the yeah. Israeli Center for Cognitive Behavioral Therapy and the co-founder of the Israeli Center for Medical Psychology. Dr. Derby received his clinical training at the University of Hartford and his sexological training at the Institute for the Advanced Study of Human Sexuality. He trained with Prof. Pat Patricia Resnick at the Center for Trauma Recovery and co-authored with Prof. Resnick the book New Horizons, New Horizons in the Treatment of PTSD. Dr. Derby specializes in anxiety 
and OC spectrum disorders. Dr. Derby, it sounds like you have pretty extensive um, experience working kind of with sex and sex related topics, but from a research perspective, is that right? <laughs> yes. Uh, ooh. Okay. So <laughs> this is right up your alley. <laughs> Okay, and then of course, is a hot dog a sandwich? That's a that's a good question. <laughs> Philosophical, I know. I, I have a I have an OCD uh, uh, answer for that. Okay, maybe. <laughs> I like it. We have to live with the uncertainty. Yeah. Um, okay, so first things first. To kick it off, how would you guys like? What is relationship OCD? And I guess what makes this subtype of OCD special? Like, why why do you guys find it so interesting? Um, you know, uh, this goes back to the story of how we started uh, doing the research. Uh, mm -hmm. A guy and I met in a convention uh, many years ago. And uh, we started talking about a, a phenomena that we saw in the clinic. And, uh, you know, we, we talked about the fact that we saw clients and initially we didn't identify it as, as our OCD, but we identified it as something that behaves as OCD. And, uh, and, and, and when you guys were talking, like, what was that phenomenon at that first conference? Like, how did you describe it to each other? Well, each of us had a client that was dealing with something similar. I had a client that was actually dealing with a lot of doubts. And as a cognitive behavior therapist, I was sitting there and doing a lot of pros and cons about the relationship. And uh, at a certain point, I said, uh, you know, this, this feels like we are doing some kind of a ritual. It seems like we are going in circles. And, and uh, you know, and... and, and at a certain point, I said, okay, but we've been at this point, so we don't have to do this again and again, and, and started to actually treat it as, as something that is more like OCD. And, and the person that was in therapy actually uh, responded well to this therapy. Uh, so, this, and, and, and Guy, I think you had a similar client that you saw. Yeah, I had a, the truth is when, when you look back, you suddenly realize that, you know, there were clients even before, I think even in, in my training, I had a client that um, she was pregnant and she was really preoccupied with the fact that her, her partner was not funny enough. Yeah. And it wasn't kind of, and okay. I think it's it can be distressing, but what really she was overwhelmed by it and she couldn't stop thinking about it and it's basically ruined her life because this is, of course, it affected her relationship, but her functioning in general. And at that stage, I have to say that using kind of the common CBT kind of techniques didn't really help. And I didn't really, un I didn't really understand it. And I think that's that's the feeling that uh, Danny and I sh shared at that conference is that there's something OCD about this um, this phenomena, and the phenomena is that pe people that are preoccupied all the time with their relationship, with to what extent they like their partner, they love their partner, they're attracted to their partner, the relationship is right or just right, to what extent the partners love them or or more specifically, they can kind of obsess about the flaws of the partner in different different areas. So in this case was the partner's sense of humor or short, social competence, but it could, could be their intelligence and it could be uh, various, various things. And, um, and, and it looks like OCD, but with a twist. And at the time when we kind of started thinking about it, there wasn't much talk about how OCD can be intertwined and can affect kind of close intimate relationship, but in an OCD way, not as a collateral damage of just another type of OCD. Is that right, John, or am I? Definitely, yeah. Oh yeah. So, uh... so like you talk about these obsessions as a preoccupation with your relationship, whether that be like there are um, some flaws in your partner. I imagine also 
possibly flaws in yourself as it pertains to a relationship. Um, what are kind of the, the compulsions or the rituals that go along with ROCD typically? You know, I think that the, the, the main thing with, with ROCD that we see, a lot of the compulsions are, are you know, mental rituals. So people can, you know, uh, monitor internal states. You know, do I love my partner? They can monitor their sexual arousal. Am I attracted to her? Am I aroused? Uh, they can actually do a lot of, of uh, um, comparisons, you know. And, and personally, I see, you know, doubting is an active process that you can look at as a ritual. So the fact that you're doubting is something that is ritualistic. Um, there are many other, you know, there are many other compulsions that you can see, you know, uh, rehearsing in your mind, you know, uh, going back in your mind to events, doing post-event processing. A lot of time people, you know, would, uh, let's say that, uh, let's take Guy's example. So if she thought he, maybe he's not funny enough, so going in your mind back to events that you were with friends, was he funny enough? And, and to... Uh, you know, comparing uh, comparing to other people who were in the event to see was he as funny as the other persons in the event. I I worked with someone who had the ritual of confessing all of his thoughts to his partner, to his wife, which of course caused all, like all sorts of problems. Like, who wants to hear that their husband is you know. I'm, you know, I, I can't stop thinking that you're not funny and I forget exactly what it, what it was, but that's, that's what he would do. And he, he had some scrupulosity mixed in with this also. Like if I'm having, I, I shouldn't be having these bad thoughts. And if I do, you know, there's something, you know, uh, immoral about it, which I guess is part of, probably part of this in many cases. Um, but he felt like he needed to let the other person know, otherwise he's not being honest enough with his spouse. Right, right. I'm misleading in a way yeah. if I'm not sharing that. Yeah, right. I'm not. Yeah, right. Exactly. I'm not. I'm not honest enough as I should be. A hundred percent honest because every relationship shouldn't have any secrets at all. That's what this guy believed. Even like yeah, I think people. it's it's and reassurance is also a common one. You know, I'm not sure. Is that right? Is that okay? That I'm I'm not sure. Uh, you know that I'm not sure. And uh, but also self reassurance. So in many various ways, so to tell us, yeah, he is smart. He is smart. What am I talking about? You know, I think something is really interesting in, uh, in our OCD is that self-criticism can be a ritual. Okay. So you put yourself down. So you're not, it's your problem. And why am I like this? And kind of around that in order to feel a bit safer about the relationship. It's not the partner. It's me. So that's okay. So that's, kind of comfort, comfort, comforting in that sense. So there are many kind of variations. Of course, you have the internet looking, uh, if I don't love her, is she smart enough? Uh, whatever, kind of searching endless. And, you know, human creativity is endless. And I think in OCD, you see it. <laughs> you see it. And it's yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. any way to, to make you feel a little bit better in the short term. Is something you use. Kylie, um, Kylie just has the question that question. is on my mind first when I think about our OCD, which is how can you tell the difference between actual trust issues and relationship OCD or more generally like actual doubt about maybe my relationship isn't strong enough. Maybe I shouldn't be with this person versus OCD thinking about that. I'm well, sure I it's think, a, it's a I think that's question. maybe the most common question yeah, in our OCD in the world. <laughs> yeah, I have that's figured. a million dollar question, right? Because if in, if, in someone, if someone knew the answer to that, that they wouldn't have the problem, right? That's what that's what folks are trying to figure out. Exactly. But I I guess one like way when I took my notes, one way I one thing I wanted to ask you guys was like, what questions would I ask of myself, or if I'm a clinician, ask of my client to try to parse out the answer to this question. Hmm. But, you know, usually when we train people, it has to meet the criteria of OCD. So it has to be something that you're preoccupied with. It's not, you know, just like, a, you know, do I love her or not? This question is something that you're going to be preoccupied with. 
you know this is something that is going to be with you along the day you know in the you know it has to be there you know more than an hour it has to be time consuming you know distressing so i think these are these are the things that people should uh, keep in mind and they yeah. affect your functioning etc right. but i think uh, you know what and i think that relates to the first part of therapy okay and the question they ask is am i if, is something wrong with me yeah or is there something really wrong in the relationship or not right in the relationship or in the partner etc and And I think this is true for many other things and many other psychopathologies. And the question is whether you think that the fact that you obsess about it uh, is leading you to a better resolution of the problem, or is that hindering you from experiencing the relationship itself? So and, and that's the first part that we kind of get at in therapy is to say, To, to come to a mutual understanding with the, with the client that you will know or you will not know, but you will at least have a clearer idea of what you want when you get rid of the obsessions, okay? The obsessions are like a screen in front of your head or in front of your eyes that don't allow you to experience a relationship, to know, to know what you feel, okay? And so the first stage is, okay, we don't know if you're in the right relationship or maybe your, your partner and all, everything is, of course, with, a, I have to qualify it with the fact that we're not dealing with violent relationships, et cetera, here, okay? Um, we're dealing with common kind of a relationship with no violence, not emotional violence, et cetera, and physical violence or whatever. So the idea is that, We're kind of, first of all, we'll get rid of the obsessions. And then you'll see in a clear way how, how you do feel about this relationship, about the partner. You'll experience the partner, you'll experience the relationship, um, and you'll have more information to decide what you want to decide. And I think, I, you know, there are some, you know, what, what I really like about this is the overlaps with other sorts of OCD In, in that, you know, intrusive thoughts are normal. We all experience intrusive thoughts. If you've been in a relationship, you have had some ambivalence about that relationship. And it's, you know, no one's perfect. So it was easy to see some sort of flaw. Oh, you know, her hair is too curly or, you know, whatever. And, you know, like, like Danny was saying before, for the most part, those things kind of come and go through our thoughts and they don't get in the way. They don't cause a ton of distress. But just like with any other OCD, whether it's like, you know, what if what if um, I'm a child molester or what if I'm violent? You know, what if I'm uh, what if I'm not in love? Not, what if I'm not in love enough? These are things that we all think about from time to time, but they escalate and upset into obsessions the same way that these other types of obsessions escalate into. At least that's that's my understanding of, of the literature and my clinical experience, too. I guess like a thing that I get confused about is, you know, we talk about it not like interference the extent to which it interferes in your life or preoccupies you being a good indicator right um but thinking about should i break up with this person who i've been with for two years like i would expect that to preoccupy anybody uh for some period of time so like what's a level of preoccupation that's disordered versus a big life decision that i really should be thinking about i think that's a hard question there's <laughs> a complicated assessment procedure that you will go through but the idea is that first of all if you need you feel something is wrong with the relationship you know normally it takes you a few days maybe a few weeks but it doesn't mean that you're preoccupied with it to the extent that it disables you also in in other domains of life okay and it, it also is very limited in time before you had this feeling okay in rocd normally you kind of it goes many times through from the first second of your relationship and goes through the relationship and basically um kind of uh confuses you yeah 
throughout the relationship and really is a, an intense kind of preoccupation all throughout. So it's not that suddenly you feel something is, you know, she, she did something and then you start thinking, oh, maybe she's not for me. No, normally it's, you know, from very the, the very beginning uh, and then it goes through. Is, is that your experience as well, uh, Danny, John? Yeah, my experience is that it's people who, if you if you say, um, would uh, would you bet your life savings that you know you don't belong with this person that you're not really in love with them? They would say, no, of course not. I I really love this person. I just can't stop thinking about a flaw or you know kind of what we were talking about before. So these are folks that have a you know the the thoughts are very ego dystonic. It's not that there's actually a problem in the relationship. Or I, I think I, I agree with that, but I think all relationships have problems. <laughs> yeah, it's, well, it's right. hard to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not like big time problems that you would break yeah. up over. Right. Yeah. Small, like, yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. I, I agree. I think also sometimes because of the ROCD, the relationship can escalate and can reach conflict. And then it gets even more complicated, of course. But I, I totally agree with that. Um, but yeah, and that's, I think... That's what comes to kind of make a little bit of a difference between our city and other kind of forms. It can get really messy, messy because everything affects everything else and goes back to our to relationship and the doubts and feeds it again and again and again. So it's yeah, it's a. Um... And I think it's it's confusing because culturally, you know, we are allowed to think about is it the right relationship? We're even encouraged to do so. So. You know, it could be really confusing for people because they oh. have doubts. You know, even if they speak to their friends, people speak to them about that. It's something that people share with one another. So uh, that makes it hard. In, in, cultures, in cultures where there's like arranged marriages, does this crop up as often? It actually, it does <laughs> come up in arranged marriages as well. So we okay. do see yeah. people. It's interesting. Or maybe communities um you know who come to therapy so you know some of them would not be able to make the decision to get into the arranged marriage uh, um so yeah we see people that come for that yeah definitely i i do want to qualify what i said before it doesn't have to start from the beginning as uh, kind of the roc it's transition kind of transition like decisions okay so you're going out mm, it's okay and then you decide to live together, then you can get distressed, or then you decide to get engaged. That these kind of transitions can kind of really put um, a more like fuel kind of the ROCD symptoms to an extent that you really feel that they're disturbing. Sorry, I just it like starts. It starts at a transition. Often, like, it, it oftentimes will. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Um, while we're kind of talking about therapy. You know, at the very beginning, guy, you said ROCD is like OCD with a twist. Um, and Matt Diaz at 1217, how do you utilize ERP for ROCD? Is there anything different that goes into ERP? And what would an exposure really even look like? I, I would let Danny, I'm, I'm more of a cognitive therapist, so I'll let the, Danny here talk about well, that. I, okay. I'd love to hear the cognitive side of it all, too. Like, what is therapy uh, uh, for ROCD? You know, ERP, I mean, beginning with the idea, maybe I'm in the wrong relationship. This is something that you can expose yourself to in ERP. So the idea itself, um, you can and do how, a lot how do you go about that? <laughs> just, just even, writing it you down know, or? yeah, like a, writing it down or a loop tape of this idea, or you can have scripts. So, you know, literally work with the person about his core fear, about how it would develop. Okay, so how would such a relationship develop? So what 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 is your worthy? What is in your mind if you stay in this relationship? And a lot of time we see in people with our OCD, we see that people have two scripts: one of staying in the wrong relationship, and the other of leaving the right relationship and then staying stuck in inability to find the relationship. Or, and we we use both scripts. But let's focus on one script for a minute. So we would take this idea and, and we would want to have them write a story about 
you know, so they went to uh, therapy and they decided to stay in, in, which is in this relationship. And then what happened? Let's say five years from now, a day in your life. How does it look? And a lot of time people would say, well, you know, I'm with her. You know, I don't want to come back home. I'm bored. You know, we have nothing in common. We have these children and I don't like the children as well. And again, the idea is to look at a script that is personal to the person, you know, that it means something to the person, the core fear that he has about the relationship. And, and you know, people write very creative scripts about how their a day in their life would look or um, a time in the future, sometime in the future would look. And we work a lot with scripts like this, but also a lot of, you know, exposures to romantic comedies, exposures to, um, you know, meeting friends who you think are in a good relationship. Um, a lot of time we use exposure, let's say that you're preoccupied with some, uh, some kind of uh, something about the looks of your partner. So you can have exposures that you take a photo of somebody that you uh, compare the, the, the partner to and actually have a photo one next to the other. But then the idea is to stay with the discomfort. So you actually, you know, look at this photo, you know, and, and, and then stay with the discomfort that comes up. So there are many creative, you know, exposures that you can do. And of course, it's not the only thing. There's also cognitive work that I think is important. You know, Guy, maybe you can elaborate on that. Well, uh, yeah, I, um, I mean, I think uh, there are many kind of uh, ways to to kind of challenge uh, relationship OCD related beliefs. OK, so if we take the cognitive model that we all have kind of these thoughts that can pop into our heads, including doubts and all of these and um, and then for some reason, some people, yeah, they kind of misinterpret yeah, and maybe catastrophically, catastrophically misinterpreted, like uh, Rachman used to say, from catastrophe. So to catastrophize it. Um, and, you know, there are beliefs that kind of lead us to interpret it in such a catastrophic way. So what we can do and in uh, kind of more traditional our cognitive therapy for our CD is to identify these beliefs, okay? So for instance, if I get into a relationship, I can never get out, okay? This is some a belief that definitely can make you feel quite anxious <laughs> about going uh, and staying in a relationship, okay? And of course, uh, or um, that, you know, there'll be horrible consequences to making uh, relationship decision, not only once, not only now, but forever. So all, all these kinds of beliefs, um, including, you know, if it's real love, I, I have, I have to feel euphoric all the time. I, I'll tell you, uh, there's one story. I had a client once that, uh, he was, uh, emergency, uh, emergency room doctor. And he came, and this is a true story. He came back to therapy and told me, now, now I don't know what to do. I didn't think of my partner doing the operation. I don't know, you know, it's, it's just, you know, I'm not sure that I love her. So I'm saying, but I mean, that, in, you mean in the emergency operation, you didn't think about it? And that's, and that kind of for you as an indicator it's a that, good time not to think about it. <laughs> so, so, you know, it's it's like many beliefs people have. So until you kind of make them more explicit and explore them and try to understand them better and be curious about it, and they suddenly start looking at it from different perspectives and from different point of view, that, they, you know, their kind of um, perspective changes with time. And now we have, uh, you know, we developed some an, a, a new intervention that kind of helps people differentiate from, you know, the more automatic kind of elements. So let's say the trigger and the unwanted thoughts and what we call the story. OK, so the story. OK, so I'm, I'm sitting with my client and my, my, sorry, with my partner. 
<laughs> and then, uh, you know, I feel bored, okay? I don't know. It's, it for sure it doesn't happen to anybody else. But to me, sometimes it doesn't happen. Okay, I feel bored. So now I start telling myself a story, okay? If I have OCD, ROCD, I'll tell myself, oh, this is terrible. That means I'll be always bored in my life. I'm, I may not be in the, the, the right relationship. And, you know, and of course, what is the, the what causes the distress? Not this kind of this trigger and this automatic unwanted thought. Sometimes even the automatic thought causes a little bit of distress. But what really maintains the distress, it's this ongoing story yeah, that kind of goes with you throughout the day and distresses you. And so we're kind of doing research of a new kind of uh, treatment that helps people kind of dif learn about this differentiation, you know, between the automatic and the more controllable uh, processes of thinking and help them kind of not engage in these, in these stories that uh, may be uh, more distressing for them. And, and, and guy, this intervention is somewhat uh, different from what is common. You know, yeah, what's is... what's common, and could you like elaborate on, I guess, what you do with this intervention once you do you just write down the story and and the trigger? Uh, well, it's, we, it's we, a, we work. Sorry, it, it's an intervention that that we use. We identify the the automatic thought, and then we identify the story that is associated with it and we actually teach people you know to to identify the transition point between the automatic and the let's say more uh, uh, deliberate and and we use uh, motivational interviewing to actually break down the the uh, ideas for engaging with the story and then we actually train people to do something that is slightly different than regular exposure. We do exposure and story prevention. And yeah, that's, I think uh, that's a, a whole thing for a new podcast, but yeah. for a different podcast. But the idea is that, yeah, it's really, um, uh, it helps people kind of decouple, decouple their kind of their their automatic kind of elements of their thinking from their more kind of controllable uh, deliberate kinds and and kind of help them regain control of and to make their own decision whether they want to engage in their you know story uh storytelling how similar is that to like an inference-based approach um also, can you explain what an inference-based approach is <laughs> Yeah, you know, I, I actually might not be the best person to to explain that. I know we've had folks, you know, on here to talk about inference based cognitive therapy, cognitive behavior therapy before, and I don't consider myself an expert. So, but I know a little bit that like there is some, you know, try, and I guess that's why I asked the question. There's some, you know, trying to figure out where does the where does it become, where does it go from that obsessional thought into some sort of inference and helping the person to um you know recognize where they're making mistakes in their thinking but again i'm probably butchering that well i i, I myself also i'm not a, an expert in it okay. but um but what i think is the difference so let's say if kind of traditional cbt um deals with trying to make what we call the story less believable and less attractive okay so and then the person this way disengage with it slowly and let's say more kind of attention bias and they kind of put an emphasis of trying to kind of break this these automatic associations mm -hmm. what we try to do is kind of break the conditioning yeah the what we call what is called the mental habit that kind of links these two processes, create kind of space between these two processes, and then kind of talk with the clients and, and think with them to what extent they want to engage in, and what are the benefits of these stories, okay? And what do they fear 
will happen to them if they disengage from the store. Okay, and we open this and we kind of explore it in depth. And then we go through the other parts. Okay, what's bad about the current situation with the story and what's against? And then together with this, we kind of, and then with the practice of kind of gaining control of what happens if you just go a little bit in the story and then you disengage and more and more, we kind of give them, we help them um, kind of achieve a space where they have the decision and they can make it. So, and that's, that's a, it's a little bit different because it's not talking about the inferences more. It's talking about this transition and your capacity to, to make the decision whether uh, you can, um, you can, you want to engage because after you broke the conditioning, okay, that this mental habit, then you, you actively have to decide to re-engage. Okay. And if you're in a position where you, 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 you kind of realize that this is not for you, you're in a different mind space. So this is kind of a new, we've been researching this. It's a, a four kind of session intervention. And now it's also with an app that kind of, kind of, uh, helps kind of, uh, enforce the learning and we have, we have very, very encouraging, um, kind of results. I have to say that this is not only for OCD. So in our OCD, we use this for, for depression, GAD, and it's a trans trans diagnostic kind of, kind of protocol. So cool. But the idea is the same. Sorry, John. Yeah. No, very cool. I, yeah. Uh, we'll look forward to seeing the results of the studies that you guys are doing. Yeah. So getting back to like, well, first of all, um, that app sounds super dope. Um, and if you'd want to tell us like what the name is, just so that if people are interested, they can look into it further. Um, what's the name? Um, okay. So sorry, first of all, it's an app. I have to kind of put a disclaimer here. There's this app that uh, I'm researching and we developed and I'm a co-founder of this kind of uh, startup. So, uh, everything is, uh, so I want to put it on the table, this element. So it, in, it's inside this app that we, uh, are now using and we started to using, it's called thinkable. And then you have, um, this uh, module that is called, if I, the module itself is called thinkable. And this is something that we just started to use. And this is kind of, uh, um, supposed to be um, a kind of a, how do you call it throughout the therapy so you you have a meeting with the therapist then you have a week that you use this app then you have another meeting and it's kind of to goes but the, but there's another kind of app that we developed which is ocd.app and then there we have this is kind of we have quite a bit of research around it and that helps ocd and we have a few kind of studies showing that but this is a kind of a including different. Including ROCD. Sorry, in ROCD, of course. Including ROCD, yeah. So, yeah, and um, but this is kind of it's a very pure, uh, cognitive kind of uh, game-like experience. And although we have, I think, several uh, RCTs about it and real-world data, um, it's it's very different from the kind of ERP uh kind of uh interventions that you're used to i think in the u.s so it's, it's yeah. a very different um yeah well um thank you first of all for you know making clear and all those disclosures at the beginning uh that's always good to know and yeah i wanted people to have the opportunity to explore those apps further if they were interested i know i will after this show um but i want to hop back to danny when you're talking about um, some of the different exposures you could do in kind of the more traditional exposure therapy sense. Um, Claire Flynn asked a question at 1218. Um, is someone with RCD capable of ever feeling certain about a relationship or is this something that will just kind of stick around in all relationships regardless of the partner? Um, so I guess another way of, of asking that question and the way I was thinking about it was like, what's the resolution here? I do all these exposures. At some point, am I like, you know what, Danny? Like, you're right. I do love this person. Like, I'm, I, I'm fully committed. I'll tell you. I, I think uh, certainty is for weak people. <laughs> so, 
All right. Uh, Fair nice. enough. <laughs> you know, but but uh, no, I'm joking. But uh, you know, I would say, you know, when you do the therapy and when when therapy is successful, um, some people definitely can make the choice easily. And some people stay with a certain noise that is there, but it's not interfering with the relationship. And it's not, uh, you know, and, and I can say I've seen people with ROCD who completed therapy and, you know, are in good relationships. And every now and then they might have a spike, but, you know, that's a part of managing OCD sometimes. You do have spikes. And when you know how to manage the spikes, you know, sometimes with a supportive partner that knows about, you know, what you're dealing with, it becomes easier. And, uh, you know, my experience is if people go through the therapy, they can make the decision either to stay in the relationship or to end the relationship. And this is the important part, you know, that you are able to make a decision because most of us, you know, people who don't have ROCD, you know, we are able to make decisions and it's possible that we are leaving a relationship that we're, we're going to be sorry about that. You know, we're going to miss the person. And, and it's possible that there are options out there in the world that, you know, they might have been better have we explored them. So, I'm with I'm with you, Danny. I, I you know, I, I don't know what it means to be certain about a relationship because exactly what, what you said, you know, it's just something like when I can't sleep, I think about that all the time. Um, you know, you might be in love with your with your partner or spouse, but how do you know that there wouldn't be someone better out there that you're missing out on? Yeah, and what does that even mean? Um, there's just no way to be, you know, I don't know what it means to be certain about a relationship. Obviously, we're overthinking it because we're nerds and we are interested in OCD. The average person doesn't think about it that way. But but if you really dive into it, sir, you know, you can't see love, right? There are lots of signs of it, right? You You maybe take the same name, you have a joint bank account, you live together, you have you know, intimacy, but at the end of the day, a uh, relationship is not, you can't, can't see that, that bond that's there. Uh, it, and, and to me, again, I think that's very similar to other areas of OCD, to other types of OCD that are fertile ground for OCD, scrupulosity, religion, right? Faith is about, you, you have your belief, but you can't see it. And this is, I think this is kind of, kind of similar. OCD tends to attack where we're vulnerable, in other words, where we care about something and where there's not a guarantee. I would say that there are very few, if any, guarantees really in, in all of life, but we could debate about that. Yeah, Claire, um, so I, I think the, the punchline there is, can you ever be certain? No, but like no one can ever be certain about something like a relationship, really. Um, and Claire had a follow-up. Yeah, by the way, there are studies in, in the area of, of family therapy and couples therapy. Certainty is definitely not a, a, a predictor of outcome of marriage. Yeah. Like it's, being like, certain, like before the marriage, if you like say you're certain that this is the person. Oh, you, oh, you know out. what? Danny, you got muted. Yeah, but, I mean, there are people who are certain they're in the right relationship, but then that person is abusive toward them. Mm -hmm. Right. I think the, the whole notion of kind of the certainty of this Disney kind of uh, this message that is also reinforced by, um, you know, by, you know, social media, basically. Everybody is happy. Every time I take a photo with my wife, we're really happy. But a second later, I'm not sure how happy we are, yeah? And I think that's a really an important, important uh, point to make. And I think, you know, people don't tend to take photos of themselves when they're distressed, when they're in conflict, when things get complicated. And in movies, many times, romantic movies, they don't emphasize, uh, you know, the conflicts, and they do emphasize the light in your eye and this euphoria and and all these kind of things which are nice to have they're not predictive and of course they're momentary and you know they're fleeting 
So you you're not euphoric for years, let's say. You and if you know. think about romantic comedies, none of them have 10 years follow up. <laughs> yeah. That's right. And that's a great point and might account for the increase in you know relationship OCD that that we're seeing. Yeah, I think yeah, I definitely think that these I mean, it's not only, you know, Instagram and TikTok etc, it's also Tinder of course. Yeah. That you suddenly have this as if, yeah, as if these thousands if not millions of potential partners that take the best photo and say the best thing and you kind of say oh no this is great oh but this is better and this is what you know just just using tinder can increase our ocd so uh, it's it's as if a mechanism to 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 create this feeling of you know there's something better out there is that uh, so like has has there been studies that show like increased partner choice, I guess, like via Tinder or some dating app leads to more RCD symptoms? Uh, we did a few, a couple of small studies about it. So we have now we, we didn't, it's not kind of large scale and not large follow up, but the direction is that using the more you use, uh, the more, and you don't know what, what brings to what, but let's say the more you use these kind of, uh, uh, these apps for longer, it is associated with, of course, with more doubt, with more difficulties, etc. That's sense. super interesting. Yeah. <laughs> and I, yeah. Uh, Danny, I would like to see a 10 year follow up to any romantic comedy and just have like the whole movie center around just like doing the dishes and arguing about like who's going grocery shopping. <laughs> yeah. um, that could be a comedy as well. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Comedy. <laughs> Um, I, Claire asked a question at 1228 as well. Um, and this is kind of pointed at you, Danny, um, that if you were to listen to a loop tape of you telling yourself, I'm in the wrong relationship, wouldn't that damage the relationship? Might it push you in that direction, so to speak? Which sounds like it has a, a hint of ROCE, like latent in the question. You know, I would say, uh, uh, yes. Uh, I would say, you know, the same thing, you know, when you listen to maybe I'm a pedophile or maybe I'm a, you know, it goes the same thing. Maybe it could harm you that you listen to it. You know, this is the idea of ERP that, you know, we have ideas in mind, in our mind. And these ideas are things that if we confront them as ideas, you know, we learn to handle them better. You know, and I think the same thing goes to scripts. We write a terrible script about how the relationship might develop and that's one possible future and this one possible future a lot of times hold the person hostage you know be, because they can't be in the relationship currently and 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 they can't make the decision about the relationship and for a lot of people i think those thoughts are there anyway and except that they are fighting it all the time trying to push it away and what exposure therapy is doing is helping them to be able to experience those thoughts in a more healthy way for them. Thank you. <laughs> um, I also like one of the things that's most interesting about uh, this subtype to me is the partner is obviously like relevant to treatment, right? So how does, how do you involve a partner in treatment? Um, do you tell them, do you bring them into therapy sessions? Like, I guess it's, depends on the case, but like, what's kind of the archetype? Um, you know, n normally we, we invite partners in, uh, especially if they're willing, because they have to be willing as well, but we definitely offer that. Um, you know, the, the way we do it, we usually actually want the person to be in, enough into therapy that they're able to discuss it that they acknowledge that it's, you know, OCD and in a way that they can ask their partner to stop taking part, you know, in rituals if they are taking part. So, you know, like and, stop providing reassurance or something along those lines. Yes. And also very important, I think, is uh, when we do this meeting, you know, it's not about confessing about what you're preoccupied with. I think a lot of times, you know, 
the idea is not think that uh, you know maybe I'm not attracted to you. It's not necessarily to share the content, but to share the idea about obsessing. And a lot of time, I think sharing the the, the specific content could be this uh, thing that John talked about that people want to confess and and want to check if the partner is. So this is something to consider when you when you see a partner. Um, I think it's also very important to acknowledge that there is a partner when there's often when there's RCD. So and this partner is not passive. So often they push often first of all the the, the client is there because their partner pushed them to. Okay, that's one. Second, there's this, there's kind of pressure going on throughout the relationship because of these doubts, because of the fact that the partner, even if it doesn't, if, in, if they don't know uh, what's the problem, they feel the side effects of the problem, okay? And also we have to consider that the partner often they are distressed, okay? They are also distressed by this ongoing relationship. So when we bring the, the, the partner and we try to do it, we, like Danny said, it is a stage where our clients, they understand uh, the process and they are committed to kind of continuing the process and they want and they feel confident enough in their understanding of the process that they can invite the the partner and talk to them about it and also to ventilate the partner also once they also want to know what's going on okay so and they also want to tell you how much they're suffering and tell the partner also how much they suffer so often this is, becomes something that also in order to kind of uh, get the partner on board it's important to see them okay and also in the concepts of, of therapy and to to show them that also the therapist is is it, 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 they know yeah they know that it's not easy for them for the partners and and how do you explain this all to a partner i'm sure it's a difficult concept to grasp if their partner is telling them i don't know if i love you well <laughs> first of all i that's what's beautiful about the kind of the cognitive behavioral model. It's something that is relatively easy to understand and it has no blame attached to it. Okay. And I think when after the client, they understand what's going on, they can really explain to the, to their partner what's going on and to kind of, and not talk about, like Danny said, not talk about the specific kind of, the, you know, thought that they have or their specific complaints. It's more about, you know, I have these thoughts, they pop into my head and I really react forcefully to them. And that's why I detach from you sometimes. And that's why you see me kind of distancing myself. And that's why, you know, I ask you all these reassurance questions and that's, you know, and kind of, but I know, I know that it's my issue. And I'm working on it with my with my uh, therapist now, and we're really kind of onto it, and we really want to know what's going on with you, and we want to share with you, and we want your help in this kind of process. You know, and, and it's important to remember that it's it's normal doubts that all people have that got on a obsessive treadmill. And, and I think this is a lot of times the entry point when talking to a, you know, to a partner, you know, to explain that these are doubts that we all have, but, you know, for people with OCD, these doubts are stuck. The partner and probably has them too, and maybe hasn't really thought about them too much, but, and well, and usually I find when I work with, well, most folks with OCD, if they're in a relationship, the partner will say, I think about that too, but that doesn't bother me. And, and how do you like, like train a partner? What do you teach them to and how to respond to and talk to like their partner who's going through treatment for OCD? Cause that's, it's probably kind of, they feel like they're walking on eggshells. I'd imagine. I would say don't walk on eggshells. <laughs> Destroy those eggshells. Yeah. 
Right. So what do you what do you tell them? How how do you tell them to interact with their partners? Well, you you know it depends. A lot of times, you know what comes to my mind is a lot of times. For example, let's say that uh, one partner obsess about the intelligence of the other partner, and he asks he tests them all the time, and we see it a lot. Huh. So I would say you're not engaging or give a dumb answer. You know. Yeah. So, that would be one example. The idea is not to, to take part in the rituals. And, and again, you know, a lot of times I, I can give an example, like uh, but recently I had somebody and, and I saw the, the partner, we saw the partner together, we talked about it. And then after, after a while, um, you know, he was responding to something that happened, the partner. And he was responding in a way that he was taking, maybe even not noticing. So, you know, we mark this as something that we have to share with him. You know, this is something he shouldn't take part in. You know, and, and you know, and a lot of time also, if the partner comes again, you know, to reinforce those behaviors that are actually helping the therapy. Um, and um, another question that I had is, like, I, I have predominantly contamination OCD um, and I'm someone who you know, wants to be in relationships. So as someone with OCD already, uh, is there something that like I can do to maybe protect myself for lack of a better term against getting in, caught in relational doubt that is obsessive? Um, because like, as we kind of said, relational, relational doubt's normal and it's going to happen, but how do I s prevent myself from, falling prey to OCD? I think it's treat your current OCD and that will be for sure helpful. So, uh, so yeah, I, I think there, there's a, the more you learn about how kind of to deal with doubts and with your fears, etc. that normally is, is a good way to start and kind of develop more resilience to, to kind of other forms of anxiety and OCD, et cetera. Uh, do you agree, John, Danny, you, do, do you guys agree? Yeah, completely. And I think, you know, some of the, particularly with respect to this, the relationship OCD guy, some of the rigid beliefs about relationships, you know, that you identified earlier, just kind of understanding that those are unhelpful and there's, you know, more flexibility and, and also understanding that it's normal to have doubts. That doesn't mean it's not all or nothing. You know, it doesn't mean that it's a bad relationship just because you sometimes have doubts or think your partner doesn't look good or something like that. I would say my art stick is, you know, good enough, not perfect. Yeah. Um, we only have uh, two more minutes. So I wanted to, I have a couple of announcements I have to say at the end, but Guy and Danny and John, if you have like one last sentence comment that you'd want people to take away after watching this live stream, whether they be therapists or, or people with ROCD. Um, it's hard to put I you on the spot, but say something really profound. <laughs> you know, I, I want to say that we have a free self-help program. That, uh, yeah, that's good. Something that people can use. Uh, and it's, a, it's a, like a 16-module uh, self-help. Uh, is that the OCD.app or is that something different? Something no, it's, okay. it's something it's, uh, I, can, I can put the, the link in the and, and it's rocd.net and it's right on the main page so you can go into this uh online program for free and it's it's we have initial data initial results are good uh, sorry i'm saying initial results are good yeah good yeah. but not perfect right okay <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll just say that, that I'm impressed with the work that you guys are, are doing. Um, Guy, I've known you for a long time, and I think your your uh, work is, is really uh, elegant and rigorous. We're actually going to be starting in our lab. Um, one of my grad students is interested in this, and I'll, I'll get in touch with you uh, offline, but we're going to do an experimental study on relationship OCD. Excellent. Yeah. Josh joining the game. <laughs> Um, I think so maybe, I just maybe the, the last sentence is that, you know, 
OCD can be helped. And I think that's the main message. Yeah. And there is there is out, help out there. You just have to find it. And uh, yeah, and good luck. That's always good to end on a positive note. Yeah. <laughs> and also, yeah. if you're bored with your partner, you know, so is guy sometimes. That's fine. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Maybe uh, many times even. <laughs> so I'm, <just> saying. <laughs> I'm sure your partner's going to love watching this. <laughs> um, well, thank you guys both for, for joining. Um, I really appreciate it. I thought this was super helpful and, and really interesting. Um, just as a reminder for everyone watching, this is one of many live streams. And you can view the entire schedule of live streams at iocdf.org slash peace of mind. Um, also, you can go to YouTube and you can see all the past live streams, both of this a research roundtable live stream or any of the other ones. Um, and if you ever need resources, please visit iocdf.org or rocd.net. ROCD um, but thank you, Danny and Guy. This was super cool. Thank you, Kyle. Thank you. Thank you. You're an excellent host, Kyle. Yeah. And he he is. Is. Uh, <laughs>